Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in our modern C++ series. In today's lesson, we're going to be doing a little bit of a recap of some of the standard containers that we've been looking at in the standard template library. So we've gone through most of the data structures and you can go ahead and see those in the playlist here. So I wanted to do just a little bit of a recap before we move on in the series and talk about some other components of the standard template library, just so that everything's in one place and you can have a little bit of an overview. So with that said, let's begin. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'll post this slideshow for those folks who are members on the YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and click on the links if you want. And then other folks, just feel free to dive into the playlist and you'll find all the videos for the data structures if you just search them on my channel. All right. So with that said, though, let's go ahead and dive in and do a little bit of a recap. We've covered a lot of different things here. Uh, as far as the standard template library goes. Now, recall that the standard template library organizes things in a nice way. Again, it's nice to have a little bit of an overview of how things are uh, organized. Of course, we've got this view on CPP reference here where you can see all the different data structures and which versions of C++ they were in. But it's a little bit useful to know just what type of the containers are. So again, we have sequence containers, which I kind of think of as our foundational containers, which we often build on top of things like arrays, vectors, decks, forward lists, and list. Uh, string you could even consider a container if you want, just with a sort of specific purpose. And then we have our uh, associative containers, which are things like sets or maps, which have some sort of key. And in the case of a map, we have a key and a value. Then we've got container adapters, which build off of these sequence containers uh, in order to implement some sort of behavior, meaning enforcing how we access our actual data. So a stack, for instance, with a last in first out, or a queue with a first in first out, or priority queue, which has a priority associated with how we access each element. And then finally, we've got unordered associative containers, again, acting similar to our associative containers in that we're able to have a key in order to associate that with some sort of value. But the idea being that the underlying data structure doesn't have to preserve order. So that often means that we're trading off the type of data structure that we're using behind the scenes. So with our associative containers, those are usually trees, some sort of balanced tree, like a red black tree and our unordered associative containers, we're usually getting a little bit faster access because we don't have to preserve that ordering and we have some sort of hash table as the underlying data structure. So with that little overview, let's again just briefly look at these different data structures. And again, if you want to see some code and how each of them are used, feel free to check out my playlist so that you can see each of these data structures. Now, I haven't yet covered some of the new container adapters coming in C23 as well. So there's flat set and flat map. We'll get to those once we have some more compiler support for those particular data structures eventually later on in this series. So don't worry if you were worried about that. So again, just to give a little bit of an overview, again, one of the nice things with the different containers and the data structures, and again, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but you can go to this link on our favorite website, CPP reference here, scroll down for a bit and you'll find this table if you really need to, and you'll be able to see what each of the data structures are, strings, arrays, vectors, what functionality they have. And really what this is useful for is again, just getting a high level overview of when some of these features were added, but really to see if can I swap an array for a vector if they have the same functions or in unordered map for a map, for instance. So that's what this table is for. But again, it just gives a nice overview of the functionality if you just want to see things uh, all at once here. OK, so again, feel free to take a look at that resource. Now, something else that I also found useful, and this will go a little bit with some of the overview I'm going to give you of the data structures again, just so it's all in one place, but trying to make a decision about which data structure do I use. Now, these are the types of things that come from, you know, studying some data structures, taking some time to actually just gain some experience with them. And then you'll sort of have an intuition about which data structure solves the exact problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, now where to use a vector versus an array. Sometimes it's a little bit more obvious if you need to resize something, but what about a deck versus a vector, for instance? So here's just a little roadmap. Feel free, I'll get out of the way here so you can pause the video if you want to take a capture of that or visit uh, this site down here that has this uh, cheat sheet that they developed. But I thought it was a pretty decent um, sort of flow chart for making a data structure decision. Again, these things tend to come with experience and study of data structures in general. 
All right, so let's just go ahead and look at our sequence containers. I'll stay out of the way so you can see all the content here, but first and foremost, array here. And I am talking about the new C11 std colon colon array. Of course, we've got built in arrays, so the same sort of uh, time complexities apply here where um, I'm able to, for instance, have random access and update things. But again, we tend to push folks towards using standard array if possible because um, we get a little bit more safety when we're able to use things like dot size, uh, which we can figure out at compile time and just try to capture or catch certain errors in our programs. OK, so anyways, with that said, if you want to update an array by inserting something in it or uh, deleting something, you usually have to reallocate that array. So that's why this is an O of N uh, complexity here. But again, it's a fixed size container allocating everything in a single block as shown here. And arrays are stack allocated. So you can't make huge allocations, but they're usually fast because they're on the stack, which is very useful. And it makes them very easy when you need to traverse some data that makes them very cache friendly for your system. Again, for performance, these are usually the best things. Um, but you might have a cost again if you're going to do more dynamic things like reordering or resizing this data structure. Okay, so if you want to see that in action, again, just search array on my C playlist and you'll find the video there. Now, moving forward, we've got one of the more important data structures, and that's the vector. Everyone's favorite. They say just use vector, <laughs> but this is again, uh, you can consider a dynamic array. So depending on where you're doing your insertions, if you're just doing them on the back of this data structure, that's pretty easy because basically what this will do is reallocate on occasion and fill the uh, rest of the block of memory that's been allocated on the heap into this data structure. So you can get pretty good performance almost matching the array, but you get the benefit of being able to resize this data structure as long as you're inserting at the end in O of one time. So inserting at the tail here. Now, if you've got to remove stuff, that usually causes a reallocation. So that's going to be a little bit more expensive. So you'll see some of these O of N operations here. So that's the idea with the vector. Now, it is heap allocated, which gives you the advantage that you can grow these containers very, very large if you have lots of data, because your heap is typically on most, uh, at least every desktop platform in general, uh, going to allow you to make larger allocations on the heap versus the stack. And again, you get the benefits of random access, just like an array, because that's the underlying data structure that's being allocated for you. So you get the fast linear traversal and so on. But of course, uh, again, if you're going to be reordering or resizing this data structure frequently, you're going to pay a cost of copying the whole data structure. OK, but vector is usually a good choice for a first data structure if you're just trying to figure out how to store data and you're going to be resizing the amount of data you have. Now, moving forward, we have DEC or the double ended queue. Uh, again, it's a little bit of a, a strange data structure to some folks. And oftentimes, if you can live in C++ and not really use this, but it is sort of like a link list of arrays. Again, you can see the visualization of the data structure here. But this is another data structure that often allows us random access here O of one, uh, in fact, to access each of these elements here. Um, and it's sort of a compromise in a way between a list and a vector, meaning that if we have to do a reallocation or insert something in the middle, oftentimes we could maybe get um, the ability to implement, or I should say insert into a deck uh, quickly. Usually what will happen, and again, it's implementation dependent, but you might have uh, a series of again, linked uh, arrays here, and they might be allocated in chunks of four or something of that nature so that you can uh, add elements to it. So generally, that means if you have a filled deck, you can have a fast traversal. Now, is it going to be as fast as an array or a vector? Probably not, because again, you are still hopping here uh, and you might have empty nodes. Uh, but that is the idea. Now, reordering or resizing, again, is potentially uh, expensive here with a deck, you might be able to get a little bit better performance again, depending on your reorder or resize, or if you're just removing elements from just one of these links here. So again, it's a bit of a compromise, um, but it's a neat data structure uh, and still allows you random access. Okay. So again, potentially some cost here for resizing um, versus if you just know the actual size, <laughs> your actual data structure, but uh, decks useful. Uh, now, with something against um, 
or something to consider as well, we have functions and you'll have to watch that video for a vector, for instance, let me go back here, where you can reserve or pre-allocate memory. So again, that might make a vector a better choice um, often versus a deck if you're performance uh, constrained. So just a few things to consider here. Now, moving forward, we have the forward list, uh, which is a linked data structure. It's a singly linked list here. And typically, uh, this forward list, which is new in C++11, is more space efficient than the standard list, which I'll show you in the next one, but with the restriction that you can only traverse forward in this data structure here, as shown in the top right of the screen. Now, in practice versus a vector, if you're just storing a bunch of elements, you have to traverse through these pointers. So there is some cost for that, typically, uh, especially if you have allocations um, throughout your program and don't know exactly where nodes are being allocated, you might pay some performance penalty from the cache here. Okay, so that's just something to consider. But again, if you need an expanding data structure where you're often expanding one element at a time, forward list is probably the tool that you need to use. But if you need to access stuff, you don't have random access. Again, you've got to traverse this linked data structure here. So there's a little bit of a trade off here. And typically with a forward list, you can make modifications at the head uh, or the tail of these data structures quite easily, usually in constant time, uh, if you want to insert or remove things. Um, but anything in the middle, you're going to pay a little bit more of a cost because you've got to actually traverse this data structure for the insertion. Okay, so that's forward list. And then we've had list for a long time in C++. Uh, same essential trade-offs as forward list, but you get the bi-directional movement because there's an extra pointer on each node so it can move backwards if you want. Uh, and again, that might be more convenient in the case, again, where maybe you're iterating through some data and you're pausing and maybe you want to walk backwards. Okay, so you could imagine this maybe being a linked list of um, calendar dates or something and you want to move to the previous event or the next event without having to restart at the beginning if you know this data structure is being modified for instance you can just store the pointer somewhere to the middle of this link list and then move forward or backward okay to iterate through it so just a little advantage there or maybe a use case where you might want a list okay so that's the idea you can see some examples here uh, list data structures themselves also allow for splicing and merging and doing fun sort of pointer operations. So again, if you're going to be doing more of that, um, you know, that list might be the right data structure for you. All right, so that wraps up our sequence containers. Let's look at some of the container adapters here. And the first one is the stack. Now, again, remember with the container uh, adapters, what we're essentially doing here is putting a constraint on how we access the data. So I'm going to pop in here just to bring attention. If you look up at this data structure right here, as part of the template, you get to choose what the underlying container is. So by default for our stack, it's a deck, but you could make it a vector or a list if you know what your requirements are, if you want to, again, modify how this data structure actually behaves. So you can actually try to change this, uh, which is something I think not a lot of folks do when they're just using a stack um, to actually increase some performance. Now, I've also found out that folks who use C++ will just implement their own stacks and queues, for instance. So that's also another option, but then you don't get to use you know, all the algorithms and stuff. You'd have to you know, make it compatible. Uh, but anyways, with a stack, and you'll find with a, a queue and priority queue as well, the operations are generally pretty simple. You're pushing data or popping data on the stack, again, with a stack being a last in, first out data structure, again, to enforce order. Uh, so that is the idea where you want to use a stack, where you want that sort of ordered behavior. And just to look at the top element, again, that's constant time. You always have a pointer to the very uh, top of the stack if you want to visualize it, or the first element uh, that's available in the stack. So again, that's constant time. With a queue, this is a first in, first out to data structure, meaning the first thing that you insert will be the first thing uh, that's out. So it's like a grocery line, for instance, if everybody's playing fair. Uh, and again, you have push, pop uh, operations, again, equal to the complexity of whatever the underlying data structure is. So for instance, if we're pushing elements, again, on a queue, you go to the back of the line here. So push back should be a constant time operation for things like deck. Um, for instance, or if you're using a list as the underlying data structure, right, we can insert uh, quickly. And then to pop or remove an element from the front is whatever the cost of pop front is. 
um, again, for a deck or a list. So depending on what your underlying data structure is, you can remove in uh, constant time, potentially. Uh, and that's the idea here. OK, and then to look at the front or the back is just a O of 1 operation. All right, and then finally, we've got priority queue, which is a nice data structure, um, usually uh, with a standard vector. Again, you could also use a deck as the underlying container here. Uh, but typically, when we're using a priority queue, you're using some sort of array based data structure. At least this is how I sort of learned it in computer science. Uh, like a vector, and then you kind of convert that to a heap or some sort of binary heap and then enforce some heap property to create this sort of tree-like data structure. And that results in what are sort of logarithmic uh, operations, okay, to maintain this uh, ability to promote something to the first element in your priority queue. Okay, so that's the basic idea. That's where this uh, complexity comes from. But you get the advantage of you always have the most important element at the front. Okay, so whatever that priority property is. So usually you specify a function here, like the, the least or greatest element, whatever you decide here for whatever data you're storing. And that'll determine what's at the top of your priority queue. So when you do a pop operation, that's the first thing that's removed. But then again, because this is this sort of tree-like structure or this heap behind the scenes, uh, it has to rearrange itself so that the next time you look at the top element, again, you have the most important thing. So again, you can watch the YouTube lesson if you want to see an example of priority queue. All right, so that wraps up our container adapters. And now we've got associative containers. Again, these are things with some sort of key that you look up or perhaps a key value pair. So with that said, we looked at the set. And a set is an ordered data structure. And you're going to notice for some of these data structures here where we have this uh, associative uh, container, uh, again, we have tree-like data structures here. So again, this is going to maintain some order. With a set, the elements are unique. OK, so that means that I can insert in this particular example six as many times as I want. But if I already have it in our set data structure, it's not going to insert more. OK, so that's the idea with just the regular set here. So we're sort of collecting elements. That's what it's useful for if you're just grabbing a bunch of data and again need unique data. It's a nice way to sort of filter out information. Now, again, because it's maintaining order, that means we usually have some tree-like uh, data structure, which is going to give us logarithmic complexity for the operations. Now, moving forward, again, multi-set, pretty much the same thing here uh, as the set, except I'm allowed to have unique elements. So again, the complexity is pretty much the same, but I'm allowed to, again, have uh, non-unique keys or to have duplicates. Now, again, you can watch the video to see some examples of this, but if I insert, for instance, same element multiple times there will be a count so we can actually count how many times those elements appear and then when we remove it typically removes the first element of the uh, element that's found even if you have duplicates okay that's the first thing it's going to encounter in a tree um, so that works out okay so that's the idea with multi-set and map is going to be similar to set but this time we are storing a key value pair so you'll notice here that i have a six here, which is the key, and then a value, which is D in this particular uh, example here. So again, this is what makes it an associative data structure that I have some key that I'm associating with some value here. Now with the set, we just have the key as the value. So it's just the, the same thing here. Uh, but we're actually storing this as a standard pair. Okay, so a pair will have the first element, which is the key and the second element, which is the value. And that's literally how it's done. Uh, and you can look that up in map. And I also have a video of pair as well. OK, so this data structure for map is ordered. The elements are unique. If I try to insert another six here with a different value, it'll overwrite that value. Uh, and again, this is a balanced tree data structure. So you're looking at logarithmic complexity for the operations. And just like with set, we had multi-set. So with map, we have multi-map, which allows us to have duplicate entries. All right, so racing towards the finish here to our unordered associative containers, we have unordered set. And the key advantage here, and you're going to see it as soon as I move away, is on the time complexity here. So again, you're going to find that these properties here, the overviews, pretty much the same um, in a sense of um, maybe their use case. But 
The elements here are not in order, right? This is unordered set. The elements are still unique. It is a set data structure, but typically you're going to have faster average case uh, access to these data structures because the underlying data structure is some sort of uh, hash table, okay, for this, you know, hash set uh, we might call. Uh, but typically that means your average case is going to be constant time or very fast, okay? You're going to request uh, to access some element, it'll pass through some hash function, and then you'll be able to request that element. Okay, so that's the idea. So most of our operations you're going to see in the average case are constant. But in the worst case, if you don't find it or you have a bad hash function, right, you get towards linear in size, okay, of the container. So unordered multi-set going to be pretty much exactly the same thing, but you can have multiple elements with the same key. Uh, so just keep that uh, in mind. And then with unordered map, again, same idea with the unordered set, except we have key value pairs. So again, when we're inserting things, we can uh, insert based off of this key. But you'll notice that, again, these keys aren't sorted in any way, right? Six, four, seven, nine. This isn't really any uh, logical sorted order here. And then you'll see the associated values with them. Uh, but again, this unordered property. Now, typically, we want to use these unordered data structures when we don't care about order and we could get more performance. So that's the trade off uh, that we learned about that. And again, you can typically, if you don't need the ordering property, just swap out map for unordered map by just changing the container, which is a nice thing of the STL. OK, so you can actually see that uh, video lesson. I believe I do that in this lesson, uh, but you can see it in action just to see how similar the functions are. So again, we also just to complete things have unordered multi map. All right, so there it is. All right, folks, so that's the recap of all the data structures that we've looked at. We've even looked at some things that are kind of helpers like span and so on uh, in these last few videos. So I hope that was useful to just have everything in one lesson. Again, I'll post this in the community channel for those of you who are members so you can take a look at this. And with that said, folks, thanks for your time and attention. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. We have more great content coming up. And as always, Thanks for your time and attention. I'll see you in the next one.